we had mentioned there's an argument which is the first test, which is considered the ten, first of the 10 tests which Avram was tested. The Midrash says explicitly, the first test was Lech Lecho. Go for yourself. Lech Lecho. Go from your homeland, from your birthplace, from your family, to the land that I will show you. We find the last test, which was the Akedo, the binding of Isaac, the same words are used, lech lecho. It's in your best interest to go. Meaning if you succeed with the 10 tests, then everything is guaranteed for eternity. The Jewish people have an eternal guarantee. They will be unscathed. They will be part of eternity. We mentioned the Midrash that when Avram was thrown into the kiln and God performed the miracle that he came out alive, the Midrash cites a posuk, a verse, that why did he come out alive? I mean, why does a person come into this existence? He comes into this existence to be challenged. And if you meet the challenge, because it was due to your own initiative, you have a share in the world to come, which is a relation with God. If Avram gave his life for God, in terms of on a personal level, he should have been allowed to remain part of eternity. But yet God took him out of the kiln. Why was it sufficient that he gave his life? And the average person, or 99.99% of people who go into a kiln don't come out of life. So why did God take him out of life? Alive? So we'd mention. Because since Yaakov had to be born, who was a grandson of Avram, so if Avram would have perished in the kill, in terms of himself, it would have been sufficient. But in terms of the ultimate value of Avram, his ultimate value was he was the founding patriarch of the Jewish people. So if he would have perished then, there'd be no Jewish people. So it was the merit of Yaakov, who was the most special of the patriarchs, that's why Avram was saved from the kill. So he should have a son, Yitzchok, and he should have a son, Yaakov. His grandson was Yaakov. That's why he was saved from the kiln. And as I mentioned, the Midrash cites a verse that Avram is considered that he was redeemed by Yaakov. Yaakov redeemed him. It was only due to Yaakov being a necessity of creation, of existence. That's why Avram actually survived the kiln. Because if you wouldn't, there wouldn't have been a Yaakov, there wouldn't have been a Jewish people. Okay, that's the Midrash. Lech Lecha, this test is predicated on Dur Kazdin. What preceded this was Dur Kazdin. The kill of Kazdin. Now, God comes to him in Choron, it says, Lech Lecho Go from your homeland, from your birthplace, from your family, to the land that I will show you. What is the meaning of Lech Lecho? Go, Rashi says, you could say Lech, go. What's Lecho? It's in your best interest to go. Letovoscho also for your interest and for your benefit. It's in your best interest to go. What? Why is it in his best interest to go? So, God says to Avram, here you have no children. His wife was barren, as the Torah tested the fact. Here you have no fame. You're a pariah. He was a fugitive. He was pursued to ki be killed. Here you have no money. You have the wealth. Lech lecha, if you go, if you go to the land that I will show you, you'll have children, you'll have fame. And you will have wealth, which you don't have any of that here. Now, the question is, Avram was at a level that he had such trust and such dedication to God, such, such conviction to his belief, he's willing to die. Does Avram need any incentives to leave Choron? 
to leave the location he was at, to go to the land that God told him to go to. Go, go to the land that I will show you. What does God have to add? And it's in your best interest. Lech lecho. It's for your interest to go. Lech lecho. Why was that an important piece of information that God had to share with Avram that you would be a beneficiary of A, B, and C? Children, wealth, and fame. And if he wouldn't have said that, just go. Go to the land I will show you because there you will be effective, as we mentioned yesterday. Here you will not, you're not effective. You know, it's like we mentioned, the flask of perfume in a cemetery. If you want people to benefit, go to the location I will show you. Okay? It should have ended with that. What do you have to add? L'cho. And yes, it's, unless you'll say that even Avram to leave, to be able to meet this challenge, at this level, he needed incentives. He needed incentive. He had to be incentivized. Children, fame, and wealth. It's hard to believe. A man is willing to die for God. A man who was a fugitive and hid in the cave for 13 years and lived subhuman conditions for the sake of God's glory. A man like that needs incentives. If God himself is communicating with him, he's a prophet. You, we, seemingly, it would be enough to say, go, and because of Avram's understanding who God is, the creator, the maker, he's going to follow his dictate. But yet God says, no, lech lecho. He incentivized them. Why? The thrust of Avram's life was only God's glory. He lived only for that. For no other reason. From the age of three onward, he dedicated his life for God, the study of Torah, written law, oral law, took into account every conceivable fence to guarantee that he doesn't cross any lines. He took every precaution. He compromised himself to the nth degree to do the will of God. A man like that needs incentives. Just trying to broaden and magnify the question. Now let's understand. You will have children. We find finally at the age of 99, I've almost told, look at the stars. And yes, you cannot count the stars in the heaven. You will not be able to count your progeny. And the land of Canaan is yours. So Avram says to God, what's the good of all this? The administrator of my household will be my heir. It's not going to be a, my child. What's the good of all the wealth and all the, and the land if I have no children? God says, no, you will have children. And they'll be like the stars of the heaven. They'll be like the... Sand on the beaches. I mean, what, why is he saying that? What is, if Avram would die, what happens to God's glory? Who takes up the responsibility to espouse God's presence to humanity? God being the creator, nobody. So telling him that if you go, you will have children. That's part of what? That's part of his objective. What with the patriarchs? Why do they need wealth? Why? Because that's where you will succeed. As we speak, you know, years ago they used to say, especially somebody has a Wall Street back, background. When E.F. Hutton speaks, everybody listens. I'm the name, I'm not quoting it correctly. When you have the holy dollar, people revere and respect that person. Avram just didn't have wealth. He had wealth of one of a kind. As the Torah describes, when he came back from Egypt, he was weighted down with wealth. Tremendous wealth. Fame. Everybody wants to be associated with the famous. Like an ever now. Everybody is going to be clinging to the words that come out of your mouth. Everybody's want to be a guest in your house. 
Avram says that's exactly what it's all about. It's not you can have children, you can have wealth, you can have fame. How does that somehow, how is that part of the equation? Again, as much as you, Avram, think that this is the location to be, and you don't understand why you must leave, this is, this is the eye-opener. Why over here is it a what is it a cemetery, relatively speaking? And that's where among the living, you know why? Because it doesn't end with you. You can have children. There is a future. Your son will be your successor. You will have wealth. Therefore, you'll be effective. You'll have renown. Therefore, you'll be effective. And that's why it's that's why it's your best interest to go. The reason why you're leaving, you feel that you're abandoning your family. Because maybe you could somehow make a difference in their lives. Whatever difference you could make, it's unequal to what you can have there in terms of my glory. And now from her, God's glory, that's where he's going, wherever God's glory is. See, the incentive wasn't an incentive on a personal level that he should possess something, something which relates to him. I will be revered to a greater degree. It's not reverence for him to be revered. Reverence to further God's glory. That's the Lech Lecha. We had mentioned that Avram, when he was circumcised at the age of 99, which is not a simple matter, man of his age, it was important he should convalesce after that procedure. But Avram himself, being involved in espousing God's monotheism, being the monotheistic being, he was busy day and night in hospitality. He needs a respite. He needs a break. So what does God do? God goes and he takes the sun out of the chief that there are no wayfarers. And Avram is sitting at the entrance of his tent looking in every direction. Where are they? And he's pained. The guests are not coming. They're not breaking his door down as they usually do 24 hours a day to be hosted. Avram was pained by this. Why? Avram Chasushom had such an ego. He needed all that attention. 24 hours a day, people accepting his hospitality and say, thank you, Master Avram. Is that what was missing? And that's why he was pained. And because the pain of not having guests were affecting him negatively more than the respite that he needed, God brought three angels in human form to explain what exactly was Avram's pain. Avram's pain was not that the money was burning a hole in his pocket, not that the inventory he had purchased for hospitality was going stale. That wasn't it. Because Avram Avinu knew that any moment he doesn't engage with people, that means pagans remain pagans a moment longer. And that itself is the desecration of God's name. They live in a God's world and they believe the world is attributed to the sun, the moon, and other powers of existence, which is, which is false, which is baseless. So by not being able to engage in people coming, his pain is that the ongoing Chil Hashem, desecration of God's name, continues. That's what he was pained. And that was the essence of Avram. But if he wouldn't have the means, he couldn't have done the hospitality. He couldn't have addressed this problem. Had he changed the tide of, of, of atheism, 
and of paganism. How do you change the tide? You have money, you can change the tide. You have wealth, you have renown. They're coming to your home. Avram is not seen as some kind of fanatic. He had this magnetic pull. All society wanted to come to his home to engage and be under his, be beneficiaries of his hospitality. That's Lech It's in your best interest. Go for yourself. But to yourself is not him personally. Himself means exactly what your objective is, your own understanding of your purpose of existence, which is only to bring greater glory to God's name. When I first came to Canaan, he had no more than he went, when he was there than when he arrived. How did he become so wealthy? Avram himself was confronted with a famine. Here he's promised all the glory, all the benefit is going to be in Canaan. All of a sudden he realizes it's a disaster. There was a famine. What, what, what would the average person do? God, where's your guarantee? Where's your promise? You promise this is going to be this is going to be the, the paradise here. Here, I'm forced to leave. Where's, where's your where, where are your guarantees? I run to ask a question. He picked himself up, went to Egypt. What happened in Egypt? Serious problems. His wife is taken, and she's nearly defiled. But after everything's said and done, when Pharaoh, the king of the, the monarch of the height of civilization, realizes what happened, he gives Avram, Avram, he allows him to take wealth of one of a kind of wealth from Egypt. He understood. After fact, you know, we say that hindsight is 2020. After it happens, he said, now I get it. The famine is what? To go to Egypt to attain that wealth and come back, now I have wealth. But you can ask another question. If God wanted to give me wealth, I could have had the wealth in, in Canaan. Did I have to have the wealth in Egypt? God can provide anything. So why did Avram have to go to Egypt to acquire the wealth? And that was the fulfillment of that part of the guarantee. You become wealthy. He had to leave and come back. So there's a very interesting principle stated in the Midrash, Masa of a Boni, that the experiences of the patriarchs will be, are only put in place to create a dynamic for the descendants, the Jewish people. For instance, Avram went to Egypt, relatively speaking, poor. He came back wealthy. Because Avram is the founding father of the Jewish people. As Avram went to, the, went to Egypt, the Jewish people went to Egypt. Yaakov, with his 70 members of his family, went to Egypt. As they went into Egypt, when they left Egypt, they left with tremendous wealth. That the average Jew had 10 pack animals laden with gold and silver. As Avram left Egypt, where he was heavy weighted down with gold and silver, when the Jews left Egypt, they left weighted down with gold and silver. That's Masa Ovis in Lebanon. The experience of the patriarchs is only put in place so this should be experienced later by their descendants, by the Jewish people. That's Masa of Assimilabani. That's why they, they did not get the wealth in Canaan. Of course, God could have provided there. But you need that dynamic to be set in place to bring back the future 
and the Jews had to go to Egypt because something happened later. And as a result of that, when we were compensated, we were compensated with tremendous wealth when we came back. Avram didn't have, didn't have children immediately. He's 75 when he arrives. He didn't have children. He was only told he would have a child at the age of 99 from Sarimin, from Sarah the matriarch. At the age of 86, he had a child from Hagar, his maidservant. But he knew he wasn't, he wasn't the one. That's not the child who's going to be his heir, who's going to be his successor. Definitely not. It could only be from Sarah. Because Sarah is from his family. And she has the same genes as he has. Those special genes. The genes of Shem. Hagar, Mitzrayim, Egypt, comes from Chom. And just as Eliezer did not qualify his daughter to be the matriarch, the wife of Yitzchok, Yishmael will not qualify as being the successor, the heir of, of Avram. The heir has to come from, spiritually has to come from Sorimeng. He did not have that child till he was, till he was, he was informed at the age of 99. That's years in the future. The wealth came relatively very quickly. Why? Because the wealth is crucial and essential for your influence over other people. That had to be immediately. The child is only should be a successor. So that could wait till later. As long as Avraham Avinu is capable and he has the ability, Yitzhak is not necessary to be there yet. Fame, that's necessary even now. Because the renown will make a difference to what degree he will impact on the members of Canaan or ever he interacts with. We find that the world was created with 10 utterances of God. What's one of the utterance? Vayomer Hashem Yior. Vayomer is an utterance. God said, let there be light. Vayomer Hashem Elavrom. It says Vayomer. Same word. Because Avram is the beginning of, is the equivalent of the beginning of creation. Avram, the founding patriarch of Jewish people at this moment, this is like the first expression, the first utterance of creation. What I'm quoting as the Balaturim. As it says that Avram, he was told to go, as God said initially, let it be. He said, let it be. This is so-called the launching pad. This activating, setting the system a full direction evolve into ultimately that he should be the total founding father of the Jewish people. And that came about with the 10th test, which was the binding of Isaac, what we call the Akeda. Go to the land that I will show you. It's difficult enough to leave my homeland, my birthplace, and my family, at least tell me where I'm going. The land that I will show you, where is that? It's unknown to a person to live within, within a context of unknown. And because of his trust, it's irrelevant. That says something about who Avram was. But that's part of the test. Give up for it'll be good. What does it mean it'll be good? You have no idea what that means. What resonates in the person is fact. Something I could visualize, something I could embrace, something that I could touch. The land I will show you. Where is it? That's the test. That's part of the test, even although you don't know where it is. It's interesting, when Moshe was told to tell the Jewish people that they redeemed from Egypt, 
he said to Moshe, tell them, I am taking them to a land that flows with milk and honey. And where is that? The land of the Canaani, Amori, Prezi, and he mentions the seven nations of Canaan. That's where it is. When Moshe comes and he shares it with the people, he inverts the order. He says, I'm taking you to the Canaani, Amori, Prezi, and afterwards he mentions, and it's a land that flows with milk and honey. When God told Moshe to communicate to the Jews, he says, I will take him to the land that flows with milk and honey. And where is that? One through seven. The location where you have the seven nations in Canaan. When Moshe communicates with the Jewish people, he first identifies the place, the location, and then he mentions the quality of the location. The land that flows with milk and honey. Why? Why did Moshe invert it? So the understanding is a person who's in bondage, he's in a level of suffering, deprivation. That person does not think or process things rationally. What does he want? He wants out. He wants change. I want to change my location. Now, when you want to change location, who said it's in your best interest? Maybe going, as they used to say, from the frying pan into the fire. Maybe the new location is worse than the location you're in now. When the Jews, the few handful of Jews who escaped from Auschwitz, why did they escape? Because they couldn't imagine anything could be worse than what they had. But they didn't know. Maybe if you're caught, it'll be a lot worse. They'll torture you to death. Which they did. But as a human, what's the first and foremost you want to know? Where are we going? Oh, she said, you want to land milk and honey. What does that mean? It's an abstract entity. Where is it? So God, the way he communicated to Moshe and shared with the Jews, first they have to know they're not going from the frying pan into the fire. The transition will be into a location which is surpasses the first beyond your understanding what, what good is. It's a land that flows milk and honey. Now, after understanding what the value of that location is, I'll tell you where it is. But Moshe Rabbeinu, understanding the predicament of the Jews, and they were Navais, all they wanted was change. And they said, look, give us the punchline. Land that flows in Mecca. Tell us where. So that's why he inverted. Say, so told him the location where. Where, the land of Kanani, Amori, Prizi, Vusi, Gugoshik. That's where, and it happens to be it's a land that flows in milk and honey. A person who's leaving, leaving even based on trust, on faith. Where am I going? It's an unknown destination. It's not simple. That only complicates to a greater degree. And therefore, God did not share with him where he was going because he wanted to make the test even a greater test because the greater the test, the greater value of the test if you meet the challenge. The end result is a greater value. That's what God didn't tell him where he was going. To demonstrate Avram's faith in God, his trust, that although a person normally has to know where he's going, Tavrama didn't make a difference. It was sufficient to say to the land that I will show you, and when you arrive there, you will see it. The Ramban speaks about, go to the land that I will show you. How do you even know what direction to begin traveling? Maybe you'll be traveling in the opposite direction. How did he even know in what direction to travel? So the Ramban, Nachmadis writes, it was known to the world that what was the location of holiness in the world? The land of Canaan was, was the holy land. This pre-Sinai, that was known as the Holy Land. 
So Avram figured that he, that's where he's traveling. He's traveling to that location. That's probably where it is. Where exactly in that location, he's not sure. It was the seven nations in Canaan. But he knew it was in the proximity of that location. To the land that I will show you. And what's going to happen when you go there? The Eschola Godel, I will make you into a great nation. I will make you into a great nation means now you have no children, you will have children. Now God is explaining what your best interest is. I'll make you into a great nation, just not only a child. That child ultimately will evolve into a great nation. Secondly, I will bless you. Bless his wealth. Blessing his wealth. Like the first blessing of the blessing of the Kohanim. That is wealth. The bracha the Kohanim gives to the congregation. God should bless you with wealth and protect that wealth. That nobody should come and take it from you. That's avorecho. Agad l'shmecho. I will magnify your name. You will have renown. You can have fame. That's what, when, if you, when you arrive there and you meet the first challenge, that's what you have there. So you'll have all the tools necessary to deal with what, to be effective and successful in your, in your mission of espousal of monotheism. Rashi cites it, an interpretation. What's Agad Lashmecha? Avram's original name was Avram, with the hey, deleted. When he became circumcised, Avram added a hey to his name. He became Abraham. Before that, he was Abram. He became Avraham, Abraham. So what's Agad Lashmecha? I will make your name greater. The name will no longer be Abraham, it will be Abraham, Abraham. I will add, that's Agad no Shmecho. Now, we've spoken many times. What was the significance of the hey being added to Abraham's name? I will make your name greater. Not as a result of that, you can have renown. The world was created, we mentioned, with the spirituality of the letter Hay. He was saying to Avram, what it took to create all existence, I, by adding that letter Hay to you, your name, there's going to be a metamorphosis in you, which is the equivalent of bringing a new creation into, into existence. That, you know what that means. You will be the equivalent of all existence. Now, we find that Avram was called the Ivri. The way it's translated, the Hebrew. But Ivri means he come, came from the other side of the river. He came from Mesopotamia, he crossed the river, came into Canaan. But the Midrash says, why was called the who, Ivri? He was called Ivri. He was on one side of the road. And he, the world was on the other side. Avram Avidu took the world on single-handedly. Could you imagine? One person takes on all humanity single-handedly. How's it possible? What about if you, Avram, you're not an individual. You are existence. Because when you had the hey added to your name, what was it? You are the equivalent. 
That means God is committed to you that you're the objective of creation. Therefore, you can take on the world single-handedly. Because it's it's that you're going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the world, even more than toe-to-toe. -to -toe. The world itself is physicality. Avram is not only physicality, it's spirituality. Therefore, he was able to succeed to influence the world, take on the world single-handedly, regardless of all the opposition that existed, which didn't allow him initially to begin. He overcame all the challenges.